Assalamualaikum everyone. I'm very excited to be here and to join TEDx Beacon House for this TEDx Countdown series. Um, my name is Asif Shah. I'm an urban and climate policy analyst. And today I will be speaking to you about um, the role of cities and urban settlements in delivering inclusive climate action. Um, I want to start um, by a reflection on something said by a young climate activist on TED's platforms actually a few months ago. Um, and this was an activist by the name of Shia Bastida. Um, she is Mexican and she said anything that, man, that we have ever achieved started with someone imagining it first. So if we can't imagine a way out of the climate crisis, it just can't happen. Um, and this really resonated with me and I thought it would be, it would be an interesting way to start this presentation, um, given the audience of the series, um, and also the fact that it is incredibly true. And one thing that this talk will focus on is how we can use one of the greatest products of human imagination and human ingenuity, the city, um, the human settlement, as a way to find our way out of the climate crisis, to address this most existential crisis and challenge of our time. And with that, I'm going to move on to the next piece, which is sort of introducing the problem and introducing it in the TEDx countdown vernacular. So the five questions that are sort of the guiding principles of this, this initiative, um, the five sectors, shall we say, um, starting with energy. How rapidly can we switch to 100% clean power Transport, how can we upgrade the way we move people and things? Materials, how can we reimagine and remake the stuff around us? Food, how can we spark a worldwide shift to healthier food systems? And lastly, nature, how do we better protect and re-green the earth? And these five questions all find a home in, in, the, in the city's space. Cities are a unique phenomenon um, and a unique structure that we've created. They're interlinked systems of buildings, of peoples, of industries, um, of transport networks, of energy sources, of water, waste, food, information, and goods. And people use these systems and networks to meet their everyday needs um, and access services, including health, education, and and cultural and recreational activities. And for that reason, the opportunity when it comes to cities to address climate change comprehensively, sustainably, um, and decisively is, is immense. Just to illustrate, this isn't going to be one of those talks um, where I'm going to throw a bunch of statistics at you um, because I think the statistics are out there and they're great to understand the context of what we're talking about. Um, but I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into what cities on the ground are actually doing around the world and how, how youth is engaging and how citizens are engaging uh, in some of that policy change. So just to illustrate for you, 80% of the global GDP is in, concentrated in cities. 75% of energy related emissions around the world are also concentrated in cities. And today, over 50% of the population is urban. By 2050, in just 30 years, this will be nearly 70%. So that is an immense demographic dividend, so to speak, that will be coming to fruition in the next three decades or so that we must capitalize on and take advantage of because it's the difference between cities being safe havens um, and places of innovation and prosperity and sustainability and then being hellscapes where people don't have sufficient access to housing to transport to energy to food to the basic things that cities are supposed to provide citizens so with that let's move quickly on to um what cities on the ground are actually doing how citizens are engaging um, with this policy and in many cases shaping it and forcing governments and forcing um, leaders to, to listen to them. So the first case study I'm going to cover is a, based in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So in 2015, 
um, an initiative by the name of Lab Rio, which was run by a group of young people, uh, caught the mayor's, mayor's attention uh, because they used social media to organize protests about bus fares, which was a, a really pressing issue um, because people who lived in favelas and other informal settlements um, and, sort of, and lower income neighborhoods within Rio were being priced out of the public transit system. Um, that social media engagement and activism, which is so essential to the social and cultural fabric of any city, is what enabled Lab Rio to make the transition into supporting citizen science and activism in Rio de Janeiro's politics, local politics, more generally. So one initiative that they were responsible for man ma managing was called Mapiando, which was a project implemented in Rio de Janeiro um, a few years ago that allows citizens to suggest physical changes to the city by marking them on an online map. For example, where a new bike lane would go or where a new bus route should go um, or where a new bus stop should go on a specific bus route. Uh, and that's an example of participatory activism and participatory policy making. Another example that we can look at is in Jakarta and in the implementation of their $1.3 billion socially inclusive climate adaptation uh, plan for urban revitalization, which targeted an issue that um, is very relevant to, Pakistan, to the Pakistani con con context as well, in that the the incidence of floods and sea level rise was so intense and putting so many people and settlements in danger that the government decided that they needed to relocate close to 400,000 squatters and slum dwellers from riverbanks and nearby reservoirs, um, but decided that it needed to be done within a humanized and participatory process, which is in some cases not what we see um, when informal settlements or encroachments are being removed closer to home. So as part of this project, the government of Jakarta put a target to build over 50,000 new housing units by 2017 that were located away uh, from the flood affected areas and that were high rise, low cost housing um, that allowed these informal citizens, so to speak, to achieve a higher standard of living uh, while still maintain, maintaining their rights and dignity. Lastly, we're going to talk about the Bogota Zero Waste Program, which was designed with the, uh, with the objective of changing cultural behavior and waste perception among citizens in Bogota and fueling a strong recycling policy for the city. One key aspect of this, and this involved a lot of multi-stakeholder dialogue and activist input, was integrating informal recyclers and waste pickers into the social and economic structure of the city, uh, ensuring that their labor was then dignified and remunerated appropriately. The social inclusion of these recyclers in particular was designed to address the challenges that they were facing, such as a lack of uh, technical training, a lack of information about basic labor rights, um, homelessness, child labor, um, a lack of access to schooling, and also in some cases, violent competitions between rival recyclers and waste pickers. Um, and this is, these are ways in which cities around the world have really taken the initiative, even before their national governments, in changing behavior, in changing policy making to make it more participatory and res responsive and receptive to what people are saying and what people are demanding. And youth has played a critical part in all of these interventions, which is why it is incredibly important that Beacon House is taking this initiative uh, for their students um, and participating in TED Countdown. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and for listening to me. I hope it's been instructive and useful. Um, and I hope it's sort of encouraged an in a greater interest in urban policy making uh, and planning in some of you. Thank you very much.